Hello friends. In our first episode we went over the best way to arrange our cells into a 7 series by 10 parallel pack, 26 volt pack. And now we're going to uh, do the actual wiring of the pack. Uh, we started out with creating bus bars out of a pair of 14 gauge wires twisted together with a handheld drill uh, to create a stiff uh, bus bar that will more than handle the 30 amps that we expect to be max on this pack. Next I mounted these new bus bars directly to what will be the positive and negative terminals for the entire pack. And I mounted those directly to the cells but that won't be an issue because the other side of each of those cells will be fused as you'll see. And then I just added some heat shrink tubing to the end of those bus bars just to try to prevent any uh, shorts during the build process. And I flipped it over to the other side and I decided to go an extra step and add some insulation under the, uh, uh, the, the bus bars that we're using which will be 8mm by 0.15mm nickel strips that I purchased and I'll add a link to that uh, in the notes below. But uh, I just used, uh, I have some insulating tape uh, on order, but I don't have it yet, so I just ended up using uh, some of the composite uh, insulation paper that uh, comes from the packs to put under the nickel strips, just to give us a little extra half a millimeter or so between the, uh, the cells and the actual conductor uh, to prevent potential shorts and it also lifts the fuses up a bit so that they can't come in contact with the uh, the negative side of the uh, case. And I got all these cool little neodymium magnets that seem like a good idea for holding the nickel strip down uh, while I put the fuses on the bus bar. And uh, so through the process of trial and error, I, I did those. I tried uh, hot glue holding the ends down at key points. And, uh, in the long run, I didn't end up uh, needing any of that stuff. The uh, fuses, once I soldered each side of those, uh, ended up holding the uh, strip down real well just by themselves. And while I would have liked to have had one of those uh, solder flux pins, I didn't have one, so I ended up using just uh, regular paste, solder paste, flux paste, and uh, put that on the cells and the, uh, the nickel bus bar, and that minimized the amount of contact that I needed with my 30 watt iron on the cells themselves. There's some good videos out there on YouTube uh, about the uh, effects of uh, heat on the cells. Uh, the biggest enemies of a lithium ion cell is, is extreme heat and cold and vibrations. And so it was my effort to try to minimize both of those. And uh, in the videos, they cut open the cells afterwards. The guy was using 100 watt iron, but uh, with more than a couple seconds of contact, they've got the, uh, the lithium is just charred about a third of the way down through the cell uh, where it heated up the, uh, the negative end of the uh, battery. The positive end isn't quite as vulnerable because uh, you've got that uh, tin cap on there that uh, is raised up from the cell so the heat doesn't make immediate contact with the lithium and internals. And you may be wondering why I didn't discharge my cells all the way down to like less than a 5% state of charge, like 3 volts or so. The reason for that is the uh, cells are much more susceptible to uh, heat and cold and vibrations uh, when they're in a discharged state. Uh, the lithium ions actually adhere to the plates when it's in a fully charged state and then those dissipate through the medium as it discharges and that's what generates your voltage and pressure, pressure and uh, current. And so when the ions are attached to the plate, the uh, cell is much less vulnerable to extreme heat and stuff from the likes of soldering. And so that's why I, I went with about a 30% state of charge so that they wouldn't be quite as affected by the uh, momentary 30 watts of heat that I'm applying to the casing. And for my fuse wire, um, I did a lot of testing on that uh, in addition to researching on the web and 
Uh, there's lots of good videos by Average Joe out there on fuse testing and whatnot. Uh, what I ended up going with though is a crafting wire which I found out through research is actually a copper wire that's anodized with gold well, they use an electrolysis process to anodize it, and it puts basically a layer of a couple atoms of gold on the surface of the uh, wire. This is about 20 gauge wire, but uh, in resistance testing, it had about half of the resistance over a one meter length of the same gauge of pure copper wire. Of course, that's, you know, with an ohmmeter, so you're only looking at nine volts with a couple milliamps going through it at best. So what I found is that higher currents, uh, say above 6 to 10 amps, I think what happens is the electrons quickly saturate the uh, gold plating layer and get down into the copper and the fuse heats up and blows real quick. And as we saw in my uh, wiring process where I got the shorts, those fuse, fuses blow real quick at a dead short or anything over 10 amps which is perfect for me. I want low resistance at low current draws, but then I want it to blow if, if it does have a sudden high current draw. After we get done wiring up the bus bars and the fuses, we're going to uh, attach and eat wires to the buses uh, that'll go to a 7S JST plug. And then we'll wire that uh, 40 amp automotive fuse to the uh, negative terminal may notice that I put some uh, hot glue feet on this thing in all the corners and a couple spots in the middle so that it's not sitting right on the fuses. So I was recording only at uh, about three frames per second here, kind of a time lapse. But if you watch real close, you'll see where I drag the uh, solder over the, there we go, little spark there. <laughs> and the fuse blew pretty quick once I touched the uh, solder to the uh, cathode there because I was pulling it across the previous rose bar. Somewhere on the cutting room floor is a piece of film where I managed to drag my roll of solder across the bus bar once more and uh, got a nice little spark. So you'll see from this point on out I'm keeping my roll of solder out a little further to where it's not going to be dragged across any hot bars and I'm sure anybody who's built these packs has come across that before so you're very familiar with the issue but first timers you might not think about all that live power you're working with and the uh, cuidado that is necessary. All my cells are only charged to about 30 percent, uh, about 3.7 volts, but uh, still you multiply that by potentially 70 cells and you've got a lot of, uh, a lot of power and potential current if you uh, short or cross the wrong spots. The idea with the uh, 40 amp automotive circuit breaker is just to save the uh, cell fuses at the uh, pack level. Uh, I have quite a bit of experience uh, with those automotive breakers and they work quite well. Uh, that one's going to blow real quick at about 45 amps and over an extended period uh, at about 35 amps once it heats up uh, due to the bimetal strip that's uh, inside there. Uh, and that gives you a few seconds to, you know, resolve the problem uh, before it tries to kick back on again. Uh, so that's less than 4 amps per fuse, which uh, will save the cell level fuse. I'm still going to have protection at a higher level. This is just for the pack level itself. And here I'm just checking the continuity through the pack to each cell. And what I did is I went out and bought a bunch more 8-gauge uh, and 4-gauge uh, welding type cables, uh, some connectors and whatnot. But what I ended up uh, wiring this first small pack to is just 8-gauge uh, cable going to initially an XT60. Uh, in my next video we will be upgrading that to the XT90. XT60 is really only good for 30 amps sustained current uh, which is inadequate. So stay tuned for the next one. We'll uh, be putting a new connector on and wiring up the uh, 
7SJST plug for it. And if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below and subscribe if you don't want to miss the next one.